Hello, everyone. Uh, it's Mr. Macaluso, if you didn't know. Uh, I thought I'd give you a little uh, recording of um, the beginning of our next unit. Uh, we're about to start the Civil War, and I'm eager to get on with it and through it. Um, so here's a little recording on a topic that we will call Bleeding Kansas. Now, I'm going to try something new today. Could you try again? My phone is talking to me. Be quiet. Um, sorry. Uh, I'm going to try something new today. I want to share with you the notes that I just wrote in uh, Microsoft Teams, okay? So you should be able to find these if you go to Microsoft Teams and look at them and let me know if you like this new format or not, okay? Um, so here's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, the North and the South have been at loggerheads for some time over the issue of slavery, right? I wanna have to review that. We, we talked about it quite a bit. Um, last time we met, we talked about the Republican Party forming. Does anyone remember what caused the Republican Party to form? Uh, let's see, can I think of it? Hmm, I wish someone could help me out here. Well, was it the Kansas-Nebraska Act? It was, right? You remember that people in the North were really angry that the Kansas-Nebraska Act uh, basically got rid of um, the Missouri Compromise, which people in the North really liked. Uh, they it did that so that you could organize that Northern Territory and possibly build a railroad, and that railroad would be very beneficial to one Stephen A. Douglas. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what happens uh, because of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and um, it's, uh, again, something that's going to lead to the Civil War. So um, I call this breaking sectional ties because the North and the South, which have been tied together by Henry Clay's American system, is uh, they are finally going to kind of break apart. One of the things, and this is all from your book, so the, the reading that I've also assigned will explain this in greater detail. Um, one thing is a novel, and that novel is Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, published in 1852. Uh, you see a picture right here of um, one of the scenes, one of the famous scenes in the novel, where a slave girl is trying to escape with her baby across the frozen Ohio River, and there are bloodhounds on her trail. Uh, this novel, which is considered to be very kind of sentimental, um, but was a bestseller, not only in the United States, uh, but also in Europe, especially Britain and France. Okay, it didn't sell very well in the South. They only bought it there so they could burn it. Um, uh, and the, the, the thing that the South didn't like about it is that it portrayed slavery in a negative light. Crazy, isn't it? Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe had seen some slaves in um, Kentucky, and she was horrified by slavery. The Fugitive Slave Act, which we talked about, gets passed in 1850, and she decides to write this novel. And really, the novel, um, it really kind of pulls on one's heartstrings especially because uh, we see slave families getting broken up and sold. Um, it's a huge hit in the North. Um, people read this novel and they become galvanized against the Fugitive Slave Act. So this novel actually helped people um, kind of like, not helped, but you know, motivated them to nullify the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, I mentioned that it was also popular in Britain and France, and that's important because of this. Um, when the Civil War does break out, Britain and France, the governments of those countries, are very tempted to help the South. Now, if you think about this, why would they want to help the South? Well, um, A, uh, Britain is ruled by an aristocracy still. It's becoming more democratic, but still those nobles want to hold on to power. And what do they equate the South with? Well, the South looks like kind of an aristocracy. There's that, but more importantly, I think, is this. Would Britain and France benefit from the United States of America becoming the disunited states? Think about what we've talked about in terms of absolute and relative strength. Um, if a country breaks into two, it's half as strong as it used to be. And you can play one off the other, which would be really good for the governments of Britain and France. However, so many people have read the book in those two countries that their governments realize that their people are anti-slavery, meaning they're pro 
north. So when the war starts, they're going to have to keep their people happy by staying out of the war and not really helping the South as much as the South had hoped for. Okay, so that's um, Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know, think of a novel that uh, was published in your lifetime that really, really changed the public's mind. Is there one? Harry Potter? We believe in wizards now? I, I don't, usually. Uh, anyway, so that's Uncle Tom's Cabin, published in 1852. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, she's up from Massachusetts. She's like, knows all of those people in the uh, New England Renaissance, Emerson, Thoreau, et al. Okay, so she's up from the Concord area. This is a picture of her. Um, you know, these are early photographs, uh, Dagor types, I guess you would call them. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is uh, said to have said to Miss Stowe when she visited the White House, Oh, so you're the little woman who wrote the book that made this great war. Kind of a demeaning thing to say to a person, uh, Abraham, frankly. But it was a different time, and they could say things like that to women and wouldn't get punched in the nose the way uh, you probably rightfully should today. Uh, this brings us to our next topic, which we'll call Bleeding Kansas. As the name suggests, there's going to be some violence in Kansas. Okay, settlers are going to move into Kansas naturally because it's now open to settlement, it's now an organized territory. Um, but there's this, um, it's, it's a company, it's kind of more of a nonprofit. I like to think of it as a junior leadership project from the 19th century. And the guy who's running this JLP is Henry Ward Beecher. Does this name sound familiar? It should, because he is the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Okay, so Henry Ward Beecher, he's a reverend. That is, he is a minister in some New England church. Uh, and, you know, think about from your literature class, all that that might entail. Um, and he starts this um, nonprofit called the New England Emigrant Aid Company. Here's his plan. He doesn't want Kansas to become a slave state, which it's likely to do because its neighbor directly to the West is Missouri, Missouri, which is a slave state. So here's what he does. He raises money and he uses that money to fund New Englanders to go and move out to Kansas and settle there. That's kind of a good idea if you think about it, right? Um, the Kansas Nebraska Act didn't say who had to move there. And if New Englanders settle there, clearly they're not bringing slaves. And when it comes time to vote through popular sovereignty as to whether it'll be a slave or a free state, well, you know how they're gonna vote. They're gonna vote to make it free. So um, that's Henry Ward Beecher's uh, stratagem. He, the, the, the term you see next to his name, Beecher's Bibles, this is a misnomer, um, it's an irony. Uh, he also raised money to send these settlers out with the most uh, technologically advanced rifle that you could buy back then. It was called a Sharps rifle, or Sharps repeating rifle. Instead of a muzzle loader, which we've talked about in class, this was a breech loader, which meant you would actually load it on the end of the barrel closer to the uh, trigger and it was much faster to load and you can you could shoot much more quickly i don't i don't have one so i don't i don't know exactly how it works but uh you could say that that would give you an advantage in a gunfight right so strange that a man of the cloth that is a reverend uh would be arming people to go fight but remember this is um you know an era where tensions are pretty high um that brings us to well, I'm skipping something here. Uh, tensions run high in, um, in Kansas because of the New England Emigrant Aid Company. Um, and it also uh, is gonna interfere with the first, I'm gonna write this down. First, I should have written this down earlier, um, territorial, legislative election. Sorry, I, this is new to me, so I'm a little slow on the uptake. 
Um, so we've talked about this a couple times this year. When a territory is trying to become a state, it goes through three stages. Can anyone tell me uh, what law created those three stages? Yeah, that's right, the Northwest Ordinance. So we're still dealing with that Northwest Ordinance. Thank you, Thomas Jefferson. Um, so uh, you'll recall that the first stage, the territory gets a governor and becomes organized. The second stage, when there's enough people living there, um, and I don't remember the number and it doesn't really matter, I think it's 5,000 adult white men. Um, I do remember the number. Uh, dork. Um, so when you have 5,000 adult white men, you vote for a legislature. That makes sense, right? Uh, you have a governor appointed by Congress and now you elect your own legislature. But when these, uh, or when this election happens, there's gonna be some uh, foul play. In America, an election with foul play? I don't believe it. Well, uh, here's what happens. On the day of the election, we get um, uh, people who we call, that is historians, I'm not a historian, but you know, history calls, the border ruffians. They come across the border. Where do you think they come from? They come from Missouri. Uh, they're ruffians. Is anyone here a ruffian? Sometimes. Uh, what is a ruffian? A ruffian is someone who plays rough. Not spelled the same, but oh well. Uh, the border ruffians come across the border and they quote, vote early and often, end quote. Now, are they allowed to vote in this territorial legislator, legislative election? No, because they're not from the territory. If you were allowed to vote, are you allowed to vote often? No. So they're cheating. They're stealing the election. And they're successful. The pro-slavery side wins the election. The uh, anti-slavery people are really angry. And this results in two different governments being formed in Kansas. Uh, the, the government, the legal government, I was going to say legitimate, but it's not really legitimate, but the legal government, the one that's going to be recognized by the federal government, uh, is called the, um, what is it called? It is called the Shawnee Mission government. But the anti-slavery people set up their own government in a place called Topeka. Now, of those two cities, you probably recognize one of them and not the other. Spoiler, you tell me. Anyway, um, so you have two different governments trying to govern the same territory. What is that going to lead to? You think about that for a while. Is it good when there's two different governments trying to govern the same place? I'll let you answer that question. Um, so anyway, those are the border ruffians and uh, that's trouble. Um, now that we have two governments in, uh, in Kansas, um, we're basically gonna see a civil war breaking out. Uh, and the first thing that happens is a city, a pro, uh, anti-slavery city or town uh, called Lawrence, Kansas, gets shot up one night by some pro-slavery types. Now, um, picture this, if you've ever seen a Western, a cowboy movie, I'm thinking of uh, Clint Eastwood's High Plains Drifter, okay? For whatever reason in that movie, I don't remember. A bunch of guys on horses come riding into town with their pistols drawn and they just ride through and start shooting stuff. They shoot your dog, dog, they shoot your cow, they shoot out your window, they shoot the school bell. They just, they're, they're reckless and they're crazy and they're trying to terrorize people. I don't think they killed anyone at Lawrence, Kansas, but imagine if that happened in your street, on your street, right? Just like some guys riding horses, that'd be strange enough. But if they start shooting out people's car tires, that's going to cause some trouble. Now, there's no police to deal with this at all. So you can imagine what happens next. Um, the anti-slavery people, uh, retaliate. And this is where we get this man hit the scene. This is John Brown. You may have heard of John Brown before. There's a song about him. I'll sing. John Brown's body lies a moldering in his grave. That'll be on the quiz. Okay. What does moldering mean? Uh, John Brown is, uh, I mean, I think pictures from this era make everyone look a little psycho. But John Brown, 
he's, uh, he's committed to the anti-slavery cause, let's say. Um, he is from, I think he's from Ohio. There's a, I, I, wrote a, I read a great novel about him. Uh, it's called, I don't remember the name of it. Ah, um, anyway, it was 600 pages. And I don't think many of you would want to read it. It was really good though. Uh, he lived up in uh, Lake Placid, New York. Uh, I have visited his cabin. I uh, got yelled at by the ranger there. Um, I don't know why, but he didn't like me. Uh, but John Brown had about 16 kids. Most of them were boys. And he's hearing voices from God, right? Just kind of like Nat Turner. And these voices are telling him, go do something about this evil of slavery. So he takes his boys out to Kansas and they hack five men to death with these big broadswords um, and just butcher these guys. And um, these are allegedly pro-slavery people. Uh, this is called the Potawatomi Creek Massacre. I spelled that out for you. I'll never ask you to spell that out. I still don't. I've been teaching this for years and I still don't know how to spell it. Um, but that's John Brown, kind of a scary guy. And when he hacks those people to death, <coughs> Kansas just erupts in a bloody, bloody civil war, okay? This is before the U.S. Civil War, but there's people killing each other in Kansas. Um, a lot of crazy stuff going on there. Okay, now, um, that brings us to our next uh, thing, which is this. Uh, in Kansas, they, they, um, they come to the third uh, stage of going from a territory to a state, and this is to create a state constitution. Now, as you know, when you're making a constitution in the United States, it has to come from the people. And it's really hard to get all the people together to have them write a constitution. So what they do is they have a convention, some people get write that constitution, and then you send it to the people to vote, on, right? This is a complicated thing that I've never really been able to fully explain, but basically the Lecompton Constitution gives the voters two options, one, you can vote for the Constitution with slavery, okay? Two, you can vote for the Constitution without slavery, except there's a provision that allows people who already have slaves in Kansas to keep them. Eh, that doesn't really seem like much of a choice. It's either slavery or no slavery with slavery. That's all you need to know about that. It's just not really fair. How would you feel about voting for a constitution that wasn't a fair vote? Would you even vote? Because if you voted, you'd be acting as if the constitution or the vote was fair, right? It'd be like, let's say, uh, you know, let's say you and I, me, how about me and uh, Cole, Cole and I, I'll say, uh, let's say we play a little one-on-one -on -one basketball. I mean, you know who's going to win? Well, Mr. Mack, right? Uh, probably not. But what if I say to Cole, hey, Cole, um, I've put your net up, right? You know how, you know, like in the gym, the net goes, oh, that's the net you're shooting up. And I've lowered my net so that it's like, it's only five feet off the ground. I might even be able to dunk that. I'm not sure, but I, I'm going to try next time I'm coaching badminton in the gym. Uh, should Cole accept that match? He should not because he will lose because there's no way for him to score a basket and it's really easy for me to score a basket. I might only win by two points. It might be two to zero, <laughs> but I'll still win. And what will I do the next day in forum? I will tell everybody that I beat Cole Parr in a basketball game. And I'll say that for the, as long as I teach, I will tell that story. So Cole should say no. And that's what the people, they, the anti-slavery people in Kansas do. They say like, we're not gonna vote for that. So who, who wins the election? The pro-slavery people, okay? Now that constitution gets sent to Congress. The president, James Buchanan is like, oh, that seems like a great constitution. Yeah, we'll take it. But Stephen Douglas puts the kibosh on it. He says like, no, 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 no. That is not how I intended the Kansas-Nebraska Act to, to work out. Sure, I thought Kansas would become a slave state, but not through theft, right? We've, we've just had two fraudulent elections. So Stephen Douglas says, no, no, that's not going to happen. How do you think the South feels about that? Do they feel cheated? Yes, they do. Okay. Now, if you look at the details, they shouldn't feel cheated 
but I'm not going to look at the details. They're just going to feel cheated. Okay, so that is that. Now, that brings us to some fisticuffs in the U.S. Senate. What are fisticuffs? Those are fisticuffs, right? Uh, there's actually no punching going on at all. Uh, it actually involves a cane, um, a cane that beats the head of this man here that you see. This is Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts. He is a Republican, and he's a very intense Republican who hates slavery. He's from Massachusetts, man. He knows all those Emerson and Thoreau types, uh, and he's just not going to have slavery. And one day he gets up on the Senate floor, right next to now on the Senate floor, and he gives a speech. The speech goes on for hours. It's like a six hour long speech and people willingly listen to it. I'm only excerpting uh, this little paragraph and I don't even want to read that whole paragraph. It looks just too frightening. So I'm gonna read just the highlighted part. He is talking about a Southern Senator from South Carolina whose name is Andrew Butler. Andrew Butler is, um, pro-slavery guy. And Sumner says of him, of course, he has chosen a mistress to whom he has made his vows and who, though ugly to others, is always lovely to him, though polluted in the sight of the world, is chaste in his sight. I mean, the harlot, slavery. I don't know why Charles Sumner from Massachusetts had kind of a Southern accent there. But anyway, um, that them there is fighting words. And um, Andrew Butler is not happy. You can see he doesn't look happy. <laughs> he kind of looks happy. I don't know. He looks weird. But um, Andrew Butler, what would a Southern gentleman do uh, to a, another gentleman who insulted him? I mean, people still fight duels. So you might uh, challenge the man to a duel. But you don't challenge someone who you see to be your inferior to a duel. And Andrew Butler doesn't think that Charles Sumner is a gentleman. There's also kind of like a senatorial rule, unwritten rule, that says you never, ever criticize a fellow senator. Even if you despise your fellow senator, you always say something like, and the honorable gentleman from South Carolina, in his infinite wisdom, you know, you just say stuff like that. So Charles uh, Sumner has just basically called out Andrew Butler, and Andrew Butler is not so happy about it. His nephew, Preston Brooks, is a congressman. Uh, these are both, they're both Democrats. Um, he's a congressman. And Preston Brooks, will, he, he's the cousin of Andrew Butler, and he's not going to stand for this. So he walks into the Senate chamber. And if any of you uh, during our field trip in the fall went to the Senate chamber, you probably probably took you to the very place that this happened. He walked up to Sumner's desk and he's got this cane in his hand and he just walks up to him and he starts striking him in the head and smashing his head and, and Sumner lays in a pool of blood. And uh, imagine that, imagine that happening today. You know, ooh, ooh, old Mitch McConnell laying, you know, someone getting hit in the head with a cane, that would be ugly. Um, and that just inflames tensions on both sides, right? The South is, you know, uh, can't believe that the senator said what he said and that uh, they're so happy that Preston Brooks gave him the one for. And the North is just like, what a bunch of barbarians. This is how they settle things. A bunch of slave owning barbarians. So this is just going to cause more trouble. Preston Brooks gets kicked out of the House of Representatives. The House can vote to expel their own members and he gets expelled. Remember, the House is controlled by the North. Right? But guess who gets reelected? Preston Brooks. Also, every year on his birthday, people send him canes in the mail. He get, gets hundreds and hundreds of canes. That is kind of barbaric. Kind of funny, too. As long as those canes are used for the proper purpose. Okay, so that's Preston Brooks and his. Um, Cain. Uh, and then the last thing I want to talk about is this, the Dred Scott decision. Okay. And the Dred Scott decision is, I, I promise, well, it's not exactly the last thing that leads to war, but it's close. Uh, by the way, uh, the Charles Sumner thing was in 1856. Dred Scott, um, same year. Uh, this is a Supreme Court case. 
It's about a slave named Dred Scott, whose owner is a surgeon in the army. And the army sends Dred Scott's owner up to Wisconsin, um, and he brings his slave with him, right? Now, as you should recall, Wisconsin, by the Northwest Ordinance, is a free territory, right? Congress made it a free territory way back under the Articles of Confederation, right? Way back when. And then the, the Congress under the Constitution passed that law again. So it's always been a slave territory, and he brings his slave up there. He brings his slave back home to the South. Uh, he eventually dies, and Dred Scott decides, hey, that don't seem right. How can I be a slave in a free territory? So he sues for his freedom. Apparently, uh, the surgeon's wife, who still owned Dred, allowed him to do this. I think he had some outside help. You know, it's not so easy to go to the Supreme Court. But he goes to the Supreme Court, and his, his, case, his, his argument is basically like, I was a slave, but I was brought to free territory where slavery was illegal. So doesn't that make me free? Um, and we get a um, considered to be one of mm, one of the worst decisions in American history from the Supreme Court. You know, there's there's going to be a lot of them. You know, people make mistakes. This is more than a mistake. This is a terrible decision, and it helps bring on the Civil War. Um, the Chief Justice in this case is a Marylander. Uh, his name is Roger Tawney. Uh, he's the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And he makes this decision. He says, well, look, the Fifth Amendment, here's the Fifth Amendment, it's a big one. Take your time to read it. But the Fifth Amendment, I'm just gonna, uh, I highlighted the pertinent clause. It says, um, it says that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And Tawny says, well, if that's true, then a person who owns a slave cannot bring that or can bring that slave to a free territory and no one can take that slave away because um, that would be by you know taking away someone's property without due process of law that kind of mystifies me because congress passed the law that's due process and the law says you can't take away uh, or you can't bring you can't have slavery in Wisconsin. Okay, Ta Tawny though says this, um, and it is Tawny, by the way, not Tanny, but it's Tawny. Tawny says, well, first, Dred Scott is a black man, and black people cannot sue in U the U.S. court system. So I could just throw this case out, but I'm going to go ahead and make a much broader ruling, and that ruling is going to invalidate the Northwest Ordinance, the part of it that says um, the territory is going to be free. He says Congress can't make this. He says Congress has no power because of the Fifth Amendment to deprive people of their property without due process in a territory. That is earth shattering. What is he saying? He's saying that the Missouri Compromise, which barred slavery in the territories, was unconstitutional. He's going back even further than that and saying, Congress has never been able to bar slavery in the territories, which means slave owners could bring their slaves to any territory they wanted to, and you could make, you know, slave states out of that territory. And that just causes lots of unhappiness in the North. And what do you suppose Northerners say about that ruling? Yeah, they say, like, well, we're going to nullify that. That is bad ruling. We're not going to listen to it. And how does the South feel about that? They feel like, oh, once again, the North is just doing whatever it wants to do. Um, and so that really, really sets the nation on a course for war. Um, now, uh, Roger Tawney, there used to be a statue of him in front of the State House in Annapolis. I used to take uh, little Sophie when she was a young girl. We would go out to uh, breakfast every Saturday at Chicken Ruth's Greasy Spoon Diner, and afterwards we'd walk over to the Capitol building, and uh, I would call him the Mean Green Man. He was green because you know he was made of uh, copper, and so you know he's oxidized and looked green. And uh, you know I'd, I always you know I'd tell her about Roger Tony. 
<laughs> she loved it. Uh, and, you know, like, why is this guy there? He seems like kind of a villain. Uh, he was removed recently. You remember all the, all the kind of removal of Confederate symbols that's happened over the last, you know, number of years. He was one of the, 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 the statues that had been moved. I, I don't know who replaced him. Maybe Harriet Tubman. She's a Marylander as well, but I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'll have to go. I'll have to go take my daughters out to. Oh, I can't do that. No, sorry. Someday we'll get back to the state house and we'll check it out. All right. Well, anyway, sorry for going so long. Uh, that's that. Peace out.